Uh, thanks very much, Rob, and thanks to Oxford University and the REACH team for this invitation. Um, also, thank you for giving me the darkest corner of the graveyard. Um, I will do my best to keep you uh, entertained. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about one innovation or one area of innovation, but I'm going to talk across uh, UNICEF WASH programs in Eastern and Southern Africa and, and just highlight very briefly a number of different um, innovations that we're involved in. Um, before I do, yesterday we heard about uh, water security and economic growth. Um, now, I'll apologise to Claudia and, and Rob and the economists uh, in, in the room, but we're in the UK, so to, to quote a national treasure, David Attenborough is very important. Um, of course, water security does have an impact on uh, an economic, economic growth, and the importance of that for decision-making and, and influencing decision-makers is key. Um, however, unless you believe that Margaret Thatcher is also a uh, national treasure, um, and you believe in her trickle-down theory, um, you may, I, if you ask this woman what is the importance of economic growth for her um, and water security in that role, um, the likelihood is she say, well, actually, right now, I just need to get water, um, and I need to have some security of water supply. Um, and that would be the same if you ask this lady in Kenya or Somalia or Angola. Um, in, in particularly in the rural areas of the country, but also in some urban, uh, urban areas. So what I'd like to focus on is more about water security at the community level, um, and particularly through, through our programs, which we heard yesterday about the different risks in terms of um, floods and droughts and ecosystems, um, and then inadequate water and sanitation. For us, of course, that is the main uh, risk, if you want to define it as a risk, that we focus on in terms of inadequate access to water and sanitation. Of course, exacerbated by shocks and stresses such as droughts and floods, etc. Um, so in terms of our main objectives of our WASH programs, it's about improving access. If we look across eastern and southern Africa, uh, more than 40% of the rural population lack safe water. Um, it's also about ensuring sustainability. The figures we have time and time again from countries across the region is about one-third of hand pumps or various rural water systems are not functioning at any particular time. So how do we ensure that, that we have sustainable, reliable supplies, which, are, which obviously give us secure supplies and water security, but at the same time strengthening resilience to shocks and stresses that may be experienced um, across countries? Um, at, right now we have El Nino and the threats that are associated with that in different region, um, countries within the region, both in terms of flooding and also uh, water shortages and droughts um, or, or impending droughts in the south. So there are particular challenges in looking at water security that we have in our programs. Um, diverse settlement patterns, we, both in rural and urban, um, quite different situations that we, we have to deal with in trying to provide water to people. Complex hydrogeological conditions, um, maybe also water quality and uh, water uh, pollution issues to, to deal with in some cases. Seasonal droughts, flout, floods and droughts. Um, Pastoralist communities was mentioned in the Kenyan group, um, communities moving. And then more on the governance side, weak governance and limited financial human resources in, in, in many of the countries. So just to start by looking at some of the settlement challenges, um, the picture on the top left is of a village in South Sudan. The picture on the top right is of a village in Uganda. Very, very different in terms of the kind of population density, in terms of the, terms of the clustering of houses. So in terms of providing water services, very different challenges, um, and obviously different technological options that can be considered. Um, the bottom picture is the one on the left is uh, Kibera in, in Nairobi. Um, I live far in the distance at the back of that picture um, in a very different environment. Um, and on the right is one from Kanyama, which is an informed settlement in Lusaka. Again, very different um, kind of structures in terms of the settlements um, and different challenges um, in terms of water and water security. Um, this is um, in the Zambezi floodplain in the south of Zambia. Um, in 2009, there were heavy floods there. And obviously, some communities in that kind of uh, environment, how do we ensure water security? Uh, a big challenge. And, and how do we ensure that resilience to that kind of shock that they, they may, be, um, uh, may experience? This is um, a region... Uh, we heard it in, uh, from the Ethiopian presentation, uh, Afar in uh, Ethiopia. Very difficult um, area hydrogeologically, very difficult to find groundwater except at very deep depths. Um, again, very um, specific challenges in terms of serving the populations there. Um, this is another picture of a um, 
pastoralist communities, communities that are on the move, obviously very specific and different challenges that um, we have in terms of ensuring water security. So when Rob asked me to talk about innovation, I was a bit worried because I, you know, we talk about innovation, we think about little gizmos that do snazzy things. Um, and really, so I, I had to get a definition to back me up for this. Um, but looking at making changes, uh, new strategies, new methods, um, or ideas. Um, and I've, from Dustin's presentation yesterday on projects to pathways, I've, I've picked those three areas. Um, and then I'll briefly talk about some different areas of innovation in each of those. Um, so firstly, looking at institutions. Um, there are various areas that we, we're involved in. Um, the financing is probably at a different level. I mean, we are involved in some innovative financing with other partners and development banks, etc. cetera. Um, but more the, the, the local level, um, in some countries working very closely with governments to, to look at the feasibility of actually the rural poor paying for the full cost of operation and maintenance of, of their water supplies. And, and the evidence from some of the work we've done with Rob's team um, in Kenya, for example, is showing that actually it's not feasible for them to meet the real costs in certain rural settings. Um, so therefore, one of the big pushes is to try and look for domestic public finance for those recurrent costs and for, for local governments to accept and national governments that there is a role for them in terms of ensuring water security and water services to the poor. Um, obviously, part of that is also linking to regulatory bodies and strengthening those. Often in many countries, the regulatory bodies for the urban areas are relatively strong, but relatively weak in terms of rural, and they, or, or they just uh, neglect rural areas at all, completely. Um, we've heard from a number of presentations today and yesterday about risk-informed strategies. Um, so obviously many countries helping through evidence to look at where both, in this case this is from Zambia, mapping of hazards, but also more importantly from our programming perspective, ma mapping vulnerabilities of communities to those hazards and vulnerabilities just in terms of uh, water security as a whole um, and then coming up with pro-poor targeted strategies um, to respond to those. Um, this is a slide of Rob, so uh, excuse the plagiarism, but this is based on some work that we'd, we'd, we've been doing with Oxford University in Kenya, um, looking at an innovative management model. As I said, many systems we know are not sustainable, they fall into disrepair. We've had repeat investments over years and years, and people, systems don't fail, and then they go back to using other unprotected sources or very distant sources, um, which I would argue is not a water secure environment for them and is a very precarious environment. So we've looked at a system here which is based on real time monitoring, which is based on communities choosing to sign up to a maintenance system. They make the payment as a community via MPESA, which is mobile money, and there is a small private enterprise that is responsible for those uh, repairs and they are committed to repairing within 72 hours, otherwise the community gets their money back. So just one example, other countries are exploring similar approaches um, and looking at more innovative models. Um, I, most of our programs are focused on rural, however increasingly with, with urban growth and, and rural urban migration, we're seeing in a lot of countries that rural growth centres or urban small towns in, in districts are growing rapidly. Um, in many cases, the infrastructure in those towns goes back to colonial times. Maybe there's been some investment in improving them. Um, in other cases, none at all. And yet there's been huge population growth. It's often on the outskirts of the towns and the poorer areas where, where there's very unreliable water. Um, so there's a number of different areas that, that we're working on there. Some of them, you could say, is that really innovation? You should be doing that anyway. Um, but there are some innovations in terms of how we particularly in terms of the pro-poor focus in those uh, small towns, which has not been there before. And also looking at linkages between urban and rural um, in terms of operation maintenance and monitoring. Uh, groundwater mapping, again, I mean, it's something that we've, we've been doing over many years. UNICEF traditionally has not been greatly involved in water resources or water resource mapping or groundwater mapping. However, in some cases we have got involved. This is a case from uh, Ethiopia where we work with UNESCO uh, with a combination of remote sensing and geophysics, to, to really look at some of the, in some of the most difficult parts of the country, hydrogeologically, um, where can we get more information in terms of high groundwater potential? Um, on the sort of the other end of the spectrum, in a way, in, in some other countries like Burundi and Zambia, we've done similar mapping, but looking at the suitability of areas for uh, lower cost techniques, such as manual drilling, um, 
in, in very remote areas where you can't get a drilling rig in, um, or um, also in terms of cost, in terms of conventional supplies, then looking at other more locally suited um, uh, techniques that, that can provide water to those communities. Um, again, I stole this uh, slide from, from the Oxford team, um, but it's one example. Um, there are many others like this where we've, done, we've supported water mapping, national information management systems. Um, and what we see from this, in fact, many of them exclude certain water sources. Um, so they'll just focus on the hand pumps or what are include, uh, considered improved water sources. Um, what, what we're trying to look at here and, and in, in other areas is to try and promote, to really get a sense of what people are using water sources. What we find is that they're not just using one water source, they often use one water source at particular times of the year and then another one at another time of year or particular days of the week if it's an intermittent supply, etc. So we need to have a better understanding to ensure water security of what people are actually using. Um, and also we have many, in, including in this case, many systems that are, that are not functioning that have the potential to function um, and, and be maintained and, and operated um, to ensure water, greater water security for those communities. Um, again, on the information side, uh, real-time monitoring, you heard this from the Kenyan presentation. Um, some of, the, some of it's real-time monitoring, there's others which is mobile to web in countries where we get quite regular, it's not automated, but we get quite regular updates from community members. Um, that can help us to predict water usage uh, when systems not functioning, um, and again, in, in, ensure more reliable um, and predictable water supplies. So in some rural areas, obviously, which are Appropriate. So, for example, the, in Ethiopia, I mentioned with the hydrogeological mapping, there it wasn't possible to put community water supplies in every community. So, there we, right now we're looking at larger schemes, multi-village schemes, um, often fed from more than one water, water source, but serving several villages, um, which is a more efficient approach in those kind of settlements. Um, again, in Burundi and Rwanda, often using multiple water sources. So, there's there's greater security for those uh, settlements. At the other end of the spectrum, um, where you've got very sparsely populated areas, I mean, if you look at the population density in, in Zambia, it's 12 people per kilometre squared, which is the national average. Um, if you move to the rural areas, it goes even lower. So you're talking about one family um, per square kilometre in, in rural areas. So to provide pipe systems or even uh, community water points is, is often very costly to start with and even the access is very difficult. difficult. So self-supply is an example of looking at uh, dispersed populations, um, looking that they may already have some water resources, uh, unimproved wells, for example, and, and helping them to improve them ensure water safety, to deepen them where required, um, and they can still be complemented by other community water sources which are more distant, but we, we know time and time again that households want water closer to the household. Um, and again, that actually spreads the demand on groundwater with small, small extraction in, in localised points rather than abstracting a lot of water from, from one or two uh, boreholes. Um, another area in, in Eritrea and Somalia, we've got very remote communities, um, difficult with supplies and, and with um, operation maintenance, not to say that there's solar systems don't require any. Um, but these have really transformed many rural communities in those areas using solar power systems. Uh, technology has improved um, vastly in recent years. Um, and we've, we have large systems there which, which um, again, supply water to many, many, many communities. Um, the issue of pastoralists and populations that are moving is a very complex one. If, you, if we look at access to water in pastoralist communities, it's approximately half of that in settled rural communities um, within countries in the, in the Horn of Africa. Um, for them, water for livestock is, is more important than water for human consumption. Um, so that's really a key entry point um, to engage with them. And as we heard from the discussions in, in the Kenya group in particular, really engaging with, with them to find out what they want, what they desire and they prioritise is, is really important to work out what is appropriate strategies. Um, some of those can be water points as they move but also some uh, self-reliance or um, self, like self-supply and, and uh, point of use water treatment for example. 
Um, and just the last one to mention, this, is, this slide I um, borrowed from our Bangladesh office, but looking in, in areas of difficulty in terms of uh, re recharge of groundwater and groundwater um, depletion, looking at managed aquifer recharge, this is something that we've explored in a couple of countries at a small scale, um, artificial recharge, but it, again is an area which um, can have significant impact um, in, in improving that reliability and water security. So I've rushed through that quite quickly, but just to give a few snapshots on a few areas, um, and even goats, you know, water security is a major issue for, and if there's no pasture on the, on the ground, they have to go elsewhere. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you.